Um, so I was asked to talk about societal aspects of hurricanes. And since I only have 20 minutes, I decided to narrow that topic down to talk about how do people use hurricane forecasts and warnings. And more specifically, I'm going to talk about how members of the public use hurricane forecasts for protective decision making. So evacuation and other protective actions people can take. There's a lot of other ways people use forecasts, but that's what I'm going to focus on today. Um, and I'm going to summarize results from a lot of different studies. I'll show a few examples from specific studies, but mostly it'll be an overview without specific citations. There are a lot of studies out there that are case studies of hurricane decision making. So generally after a major storm, um, somebody will go and ask people how they made decisions or what they did during the hurricane, um, things like that. There aren't that many studies of during a storm where people actually do asking them during the storm. Most of the, storms, the, most of the studies are retrospective, so that's one limitation. There are also a number of studies where people ask um, kind of hypothetical or general hurricane decision making questions. So for example, if a category five storm um, was going to affect your residents, what would you do? And then studies of hurricane risk perception and communication. So I'm going to summarize results from a lot of these different studies together. Um, one point is that there are a lot of studies like this out there, and they're usually reported in the non-meteorological literature. There is some more integration in the last few years of these kind of, this kind of work into the meteorological community, but a lot of the work that's out there is in other literature. And one example, if you're interested in um, seeing what's, what's known in this area, is our, um, there's a series of review papers in the journal Natural Hazards Review in August 2007 that summarizes a lot of the work up to around 2005 in this area, and there's been a lot of work more recently since then. OK, so the way I've decided to organize my talk is in terms of some common myths about how people use hurricane forecasts, and then what is the reality of how people use forecasts. So one myth is that there's a correct decision as the hurricane approaches. And this is often thought of in terms of evacuation. So a good example of this is Hurricane Katrina. This is one of the forecasts a couple of days before the storm um, hit the New Orleans area and the Mississippi coast. And you can see that the forecast was pretty good, showing the storm was coming. A lot of people evacuated, but a lot of people didn't. So we saw situations like this where people were in water trying to get out of their homes. This is not actually the worst case scenario for a lot of people. There are a lot of things that happened that were worse. But when you look at this forecast, a lot of people say, why didn't these people get out? They should have gotten out. That was the correct decision. So on one level, that's true. But in, in reality, people make decisions using the best information they have based on their individual situation and their perception of hurricane risk. So they have different kinds of information. They have different situations. And they perceive hurricane risk differently. And people make decisions based on that. Um, so the first point is that hindsight is always 2020. You can always look back and say that, you know, we know now that that forecast was accurate, but was fairly accurate, actually, um, and that the levees did break, but you didn't know that before the fact. Um, so it's hard to judge what people should have done at the time. Um, another point is that some people should shelter in place. And this is complicated because people don't always know whether they should be sheltering in place or whether they should be evacuating. But if everybody in an area evacuates and there's not enough room to get enough time to get everybody out, some people really aren't at direct life risk and emergency managers would prefer for those people to stay. Okay. So people have to decide, are they the ones that should shelter in place or are they the ones that should leave? Some people will stay no matter what. Um, I've done some studies after, after um, hurricanes asking people whether they left or not and why they did. And um, you have people that just say, you know what, I'm just not going to leave. Um, some of them, it might be because they're, they've seen a lot of hurricanes and they feel like it's their time. Some people think it's fun to sit through a hurricane. Um, we talked to one man who, um, after Hurricane Ike, basically he, this was kind of a you know, story to tell over a beer with all of his friends. He's sitting down, down in the garage, you know, people coming by, and he's telling the great story about how he went through four feet of water in his house and was wondering whether the water was going to come higher and was trying to save his big screen TV. And it was a great story for him. And he's going to stay every time. So he can do that. He sends his wife out of town, but he stays. Some people are going to do that. And you know, there's not really that much you can do about it. Um, it's OK if they're making a decision for themselves. But if they're making a decision that's put somebody else's life at risk, like a family member or um, an emergency responder, then that's probably not OK. But that's just the reality. People are going to make their own decisions. Um, a more general point is that most people occasionally make decisions that experts would consider unwise. So we all face all kinds of risks every day. Um, we drive our cars. We run through a red light occasionally or yellow light. We talk on our cell phones. We make health decisions. And um, we all sometimes make decisions that somebody who's a real expert in that would say was probably not the best thing to do. So if you think about how you look at risk in your everyday life, um, people did make different decisions in different situations. And then another point is that every decision situation is unique. So um, you can't really evaluate a decision from outside. Every situation is unique. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. So as an illustration of these last few points, um, this is kind of an exaggeration. But this is a picture after Hurricane Ike that was taken on the Boulevard Peninsula, I believe. 
Um, so this is the gulf out here, and the storm surge came in, I think it was about 16 feet maybe. As you can see, it obliterated everything in this area except for this one house that had been rebuilt after a previous hurricane. This house um, stood up. So um, you can see that it probably wasn't a good idea to stay through this storm, even in this house that was still standing. I'm sure it would not have been pleasant, and maybe you wouldn't have survived. But the point is that you don't actually know. Somebody's house may be built more strongly, or um, they might have a different situation that might make it OK for them to stay in a certain situation. And the other point is that some people think that they are going to be this person whose house is going to be left standing, even when they won't be. So some people actually perceive risk differently and think that they're the ones that are going to be OK, and that's why they stay. OK, another um, myth when people think about the use of weather forecasts is that decisions are individual, one-time, yes, no decisions. So you kind of picture maybe somebody sitting around their house and saying, should I leave or should I, should I go? Uh, should I leave or should I stay? And they make that decision, and then they, do, um, they either leave or they stay. But in reality, decisions are complex, they're multidimensional, interactive, and evolving. So most decisions are household or family-based. So people are interacting with other members of their household, often other, other members of their community to make the decision. They don't make a decision for themselves. They make a decision in conjunction with their family. Most decisions unfold as a hurricane approaches and information evolves. Um, in fact, often these decisions unfold as the hurricane season evolves. So they, people might experience several storms in the season, and that each storm kind of affects how they respond to the next storm. Um, and off, most people hear about a storm that might be coming five days or even more in advance, and they're actually following the information, they're making a decision as that information evolves. Um, decisions evolve trade-offs. Um, remember one person we talked to talked about the importance of time for preparation versus evacuation. So you want to prepare your home, but you also want to leave before there's too much traffic. And so if you want to leave early, that means less time to prepare your home. And you have to make a decision at which point are you prepared enough that you're going to get up and leave. So these, these, these um, decisions can be complicated and they involve trade-offs. And then people have a variety of constraints. And um, a lot of the studies that look at why people don't evacuate focus on these issues. There's money. People don't have money to evacuate. They might have a work obligation, or they might be worried they're going to lose their job if they leave. Um, they don't have transportation. Other household members might be ill or have a, a don't, not want to go. They have pets, all those kinds of things. So these constraints people have are one point. But an, more, another point is that it's actually more complicated than that. So all of these different constraints can interact. We've talked to people who say they have a car, but they evacuated during Rita and they got stuck in traffic. Their cars are very reliable. They don't want to get stuck in the road because their car might break down, and so they stayed. Or somebody who. Um, we talked to somebody who has five pit bulls. He couldn't cash his checks. So he didn't have enough money. He was worried about finding a place to stay with his five pit bulls, so he stayed. And um, you can talk about kind of how you can help people with pets evacuate, but in reality, if you have five pit bulls, it's probably always going to be hard to find a hotel room to stay in. <laughs> you can talk about the wisdom of having those five pit bulls. <laughs> but people have these constraints that, you, that um, we don't really know about, and that's what makes every decision a unique situation. OK. So another myth is that most people evacuate in response to public officials' recommendations. This might have been true 20 years ago or 100 years ago. I'm not really sure. Um, but it's not true anymore, if it was ever true. Some people evacuate in response to public officials' recommendations, but not everybody does. So sometimes when people think about this, the corollary to this is that the really a major role of public sector hurricane forecasts is to convey risk to public officials so those public officials can convey appropriate protective actions to the public. That is an important role, but it's not the whole story. So public officials' recommendations are important to some people, but many people, in fact, it seems like most people are actually evaluating their own risk as a hurricane approaches. So the first aspect of this is that different people weigh factors differently in their decisions. So some people, um, we've done studies, and other people have done studies after hurricanes, ask people why they evacuated or didn't. And maybe 10 or 15% of people say, there was an evacuation order, so I decided to leave. Everybody else has a different reason. So those evacuation orders may have played a role, but they weren't the most important factor. So this is just an illustration of how people weigh different factors differently in their decisions. Um, here's an example of that. There was a study by Gladwin and colleagues um, in 2001 following Hurricane Andrew, where they interviewed people to, see, to develop a decision tree of how they made decisions about whether they should evacuate or not. And then um, this is actually a part of the decision tree. You can see these boxes or other subroutines. And they went and interviewed um, more people to see how they followed along that decision tree. So you can see this is based on 954 cases. This is in um, southern Florida. So you can see how you follow down this decision tree. Um, first of all, if you live in, a, live in a senior citizen household, you go through a whole different decision algorithm. Um, then you have to know whether you live in an evacuation zone. Then if you do know that, you know, have to know their evacuation order that's been given. So I'm going to blow up this part of the diagram for you so you can see a little better. OK, so if you know evacuation order has been given, then there's this important point where it says, do you think it's necessary to follow an evacuation order when given? You can see that 99 of these people said yes, and they just they evacuate unless there's some constraint. 
But more people actually don't think it's important to follow an evacuation order when given. And even more important than that is you see that most people actually, 700 people actually just go through this part of the subroutine. They don't even go through this part where they, where they think about whether it's important to follow an evacuation order. They're just talk, thinking about whether the hurricane is risky for them. So that's an illustration that evacuation orders play a role. For some people, that is a primary decision factor. But for a lot of people, they're really thinking about whether the hurricane is risky. OK. So because people are trying to evaluate the hurricane is risky, and because there's so much information available nowadays, most people obtain forecasts from multiple sources frequently as a hurricane approaches. So we've done some studies where we've asked people where they're getting their forecasts from and how often they're getting their forecasts. And they're really getting their forecasts from a lot of different sources, from different TV stations, cable TV, local TV, the internet, newspapers, other people, all kinds of things. I'll, I'll talk about this later. And they're getting forecasts very frequently. In fact, when you ask people how often they're getting forecasts, a couple days before the storm, about half the people say they were constantly getting forecasts. They had the TV on all the time or the radio on all the time, wherever they are, preparing or evacuating. So they're getting a lot of information. So together, what this means is the fact that people are evaluating their own risk and they're obtaining a lot of information means that it is important to effectively communicate hurricane risk to the public. We're really just starting to think about how to do that well, as we talked about a little bit earlier in one of the earlier talks. OK. So when you're thinking about how do you communicate hurricane risk, um, sometimes we really focus on people wanting to know where the hurricane will go and how strong it will be. And that's what leads to develop this kind of graphic, which has a lot of strengths. I'm not critiquing it. But um, this graphic, the cone of uncertainty that, we, that we've all seen, um, really focuses on where the hurricane is going to go and how strong it's going to be. And that's useful information to some extent. But it's really hard for somebody who lives over here to evaluate what their risk is based on this graphic. Yeah? OK. Um, what people really want to know is what conditions their residents will experience and what the hurricane's impacts will be. They want to know how strong the wind's going to be, how high is the storm surge, are they going to be out of power, how long is it going to be before they're able to come back, if they evacuate, all those kinds of things. This information, they want this because it helps them evaluate their risk given their situation. So um, after Hurricane Rita, I worked with um, some students who interviewed people about their decisions. And one man they talked to, um, he decided to stay in his house because the forecast for the storm surge in his area was, say, 11 feet. His home is 8 feet above sea level. He's taller than three feet, so. <clears throat> uh, and he has a second floor, so no problem. He stayed. You might think this is not the brightest decision to make, but this is a guy who's paying attention to the forecast, and he's, he's listening, and he's evaluating his own risk in a pretty sophisticated way, actually, if you think about it. Um, <clears throat> the students were dismayed by that story. Anyway, and he was fine. I think, actually, the storm surge wasn't that high, so he didn't even, his house didn't even get wet. But people are making these kind of decisions. OK, so because we want to know what the, what the um, impacts are going to be in their area, that leads to these other kind of graphics. For example, this is one from the National Hurricane Center that shows the probability of hurricane force winds in different locations. So this is a step in the right direction. This is, this is helpful information. Um, I forgot to mention, this is an example um, from a hypothetical hurricane that the National Hurricane Center developed for a Florida exercise that we're also using for a project we're doing, a storm that hits Miami. Um, and then based on the information of, about this storm, the um, Hurricane National Weather Service Hurricane Forecast Office developed the kind of, these kind of graphics they're testing out. This looks at the, this um, illustrates the wind impact, and this illustrates the coastal flooding impact. Um, so these are kind of experimental graphics they're working on. I would argue this probably isn't that understandable to most members of the public, so it needs some work. Um, and that leads to the next point, which is really about how do we communicate hurricane information. And so then, some people also think there's a best way to communicate hurricane risk messages. So if we could come up with this one graphic that would really communicate everything, it would work, and everybody would understand what was going on, and we could, we could really improve the, the situation, get people to evacuate, or make, make good decisions. But in reality, hurricane risk messages should and will be communicated in different ways to different audiences. So first, there's the should part, and that's because different people have different information capacities, so they can. Um, some people can read a map easily. Some people can't. Some people can understand numbers and probabilities better than others. Some people just have um, different ways that they learn. And so people have different information capacities. People have different inf interests in information. Some people want a lot of information. Some people want less. People have different information needs based on their situation. So hurricane risk messages should be communicated in different ways to different audiences because there are all these different people that have different needs. And then there's the will be communicated in different ways. Um, people obtain information from different sources. There are so many different places out there that hurricane forecasts are communicated. And everybody has their preferred source. And so people are going to be able to obtain information from these different sources. And these sources are really diversifying. And then much information is received second or third hand. 
So even if there was a perfect graphic, most people wouldn't get that directly from the source. They would get it from somebody else who would have changed it. And so then you have this issue where people are getting different information. So just to illustrate that, this is um, some results from a study we did of Hurricane Ike after landfall. This shows the different sources of information that people used. Um, so as you can see, um, almost everybody got information from some kind of television. Um, and people got it, but a lot of people got information from multiple sources. I think the average was about four sources of these different sources people got information from. As you can see, most of these sources are not actually firsthand. So the National Hurricane Center and the Weather Service is producing forecasts. Most people are getting information secondhand. A lot of people are getting information very secondhand. So a lot of internet sources, and especially family and friends, people get information from work. Those are very secondhand information sources. And you have to think about how the information is going to be translated as it goes down the chain. And that's really a major issue in communication and forecasts. Um, so what this all means is there's significant room for improvement in communication of hurricane risk. So it's important to communicate hurricane risk more effectively, and we need to learn how to do it. So just to close up, these are the five points I made to kind of um, counter those myths that are, that are out there sometimes. And the take-home point is that communicating hurricane risk more effectively is important. We talked about that earlier today. Um, it's important in order to help people make better decisions. And it really requires understanding better how people interpret and use different kinds of information so we can design more effective communication formats. So I'll close there and take any questions if we have time. Thank you.